Welcome to American Players Theater, Talk Backs to Go. I'm Buzz Kemper, and I invite you to take a walk over to the Touchstone with Orange Schroeder and me, as Orange talks with director Ron O.J. Parson and actors Jim DeVita and Gavin Lawrence about APT's 2018 production of Blood Knot by Atoll Fugard. We're talking about Blood Knot, a play by Atoll Fugard, uh, and I have with me Jim DeVita, who's playing Morris, and Gavin Lawrence, who's playing his brother, Zachariah, and a new director for APT, Ron O.J. Parson. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming today. And uh, I want to start out by mentioning that APT audience have seen um, Fugard's play Exits and Entrances in 2010, and in 2015, The Island, which he co-authored. But what, what should we know about him as a playwright? Wow, that's a that's a great question. I think one of the things is the when he was writing the plays during apartheid. I mean, you know, they were risking their lives to do theater. And granted, we we know theater is very political, but in that sense, that's the most political you can be if you go to jail if you if you do a play. So I think that to me, that's an aspect that uh, you know I try to key in on because he's such a great playwright. But what they had to do to do the plays. And I think that's one thing. And also, Blood Knot was his first play uh, that was produced and his first time that a black actor and a white actor were seen on stage in South Africa, which was against the law right. at the time. Yeah. And it kind of informed his other plays. He said he found his voice as a writer uh, writing Blood Knot. And we found, too, kind of, you know, that it's, it's kind of about, you know, his own life. He, he's very... Uh, it's. I guess somewhat autobiographical in this play. You know, we we're finding that as we as we get through it, though, we're discovering things about him as well as the play. <laughs> so that's interesting too. And the two brothers in the play are are biracial with the same black mother and different fathers, but uh, one of them is much lighter skinned. And uh, Fugard, as you were just mentioning, this was his first breakthrough play. He played uh, one of the brothers on stage in 1961. I know that um, it's a little controversial that, Jim, you're playing the role uh, not mm-hmm. as a person of mixed race. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, as as we, we were just saying, we should know that Mr. Fugard is a white man from South Africa, and uh, he also originated, originated the role. And um, it's funny, the, the role has always been tra- traditionally played by a white man, because as, as Mr. Fugard said in his writing, it's the play is an extended metaphor. They use the example of it's... It's not. It's um, allegorical, not biological, and the whole extended metaphor of the play is how, how do we get along together as brothers on this earth? A white, you know, here's a white body and a black body from the same mother. And, I mean, that's the metaphor. You know, one of the metaphors in the play. Um, but again, it's I think since nights for forty years or so, it's been played by a white man. But the world has changed, and and there still was a question: Is it appropriate in this day and age for me to play? someone of mixed race. And we talked about it. I talked about it with my partner and the director and, and people of color that I know and trust. And some people didn't thought maybe this should not be done today. And uh, I was concerned about it enough that I, I wrote Mr. Fugard. And I didn't know if I would be able to get through to him. But I took a chance and I wrote his agent. And lo and behold, a month later, I got a very nice letter from him. And uh, basically have his blessing to do the show. And he was saying that it's not that it can't be played by a person of mixed race, but he believes the metaphor is stronger of what the play is starting to say with a white man and a black man on stage, which was, as you said, illegal when they did it. And I think of that time, what that must have been like. Because when you see the play, when you hear what's said in the play, I, I can't quite imagine him, that cast doing that play at that time in, in South Africa. What that well, I think also, like. too, um, the character needs to be authentically looking like he could pass for white. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of biracial people that can literally pass uh, for white. Every every biracial person can't pass. I so. think, yeah, I think it says something to an audience. It's really different if an audience can recognize an actor on stage as, oh, he may be black, right. as opposed to an audience looking at an actor and without a doubt knowing or believing that he's white. Exactly. To have those two people uh, come from the same mother says something, as Jimmy was saying, on a larger kind of allegorical le- level that is uh, that makes the play, I think, human and universal. Mm-hmm. And what is your relationship like as brothers? 
<laughs> wow, that's, that's a great that's what question. the play is. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. We're st- I'm still discovering what it is. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, we without giving away too much, we haven't seen each other for quite some time. Ten years. Uh, so we are trying to, you know, kind of navigate what this uh, new relationship is uh, with at, at the same time like pulling from the past. I think we have at times a very uh, tempestuous relationship. And clearly, I mean, uh, in we've said it in 1961, height of apartheid, and for a black brother and a white brother to be dealing with that reality at the time, I'm sure that each of them has a different experience. And I think at times one may be resentful of the other's privileges or lack thereof. And are you also different personalities in addition to being different races? I would hope so. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. But go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, but we're also finding similarities, too. Yeah. It's, it's like, um, you know, but I have been away for 10 years passing as a white person, you know, out, and I've come back after 10 years of that with all the privilege that that entailed. Um, um, come back to this, you know, part of the play is why I come back, which I don't, I think we won't give away too much of that, but that's what the play is about. But sure, we find some stuff, and there's things that I'm jealous of your life, I think, at times, Mm -hmm. because of the things I've missed, which is family and love and stuff like that, because it's very lonely passing as a, trying to pass in a white world, Mm -hmm. and the anxiety that's around that of always waiting, because it wasn't just like passing, it's like passing, if you get caught passing, you're going to jail at this Mm -hmm. time, so, um, yeah, I think we're very different in some ways, and then we're finding ways, I think, where we where we find some similarities. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, well, we try to find different parts in the play that we could show that there is a blood tie. You know, mannerisms and things like that. Maybe there's something, but we didn't want to overplay that. But the fact is, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're brothers, so you do hopefully see things in them to say, yeah, oh, okay, I can see that they're tied together mm-hmm. in some way. Yeah. Is, is that where the title Blood Knot comes from? Yeah, well... I'm sure. <laughs> what, what What is a blood knot? Good question. <laughs> Kevin's looking at me. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it is a, it, you know, there's, Tec- I mean, there's technically, it's, tec- technically it is kind of knot that is used for many things, but we used to use it on fishing boats often, you know, it's a, a knot basically that doesn't come out. You know, some knots, are, some knots you tie are easy to get out and they need to be easy. Like, you know, you're trying a bowling on an anchor or something like that. It needs to hold, but also be able to get it out when you need it. And a blood knot usually does not come out. And I heard it's in, they use it in repelling too, or yeah, yeah, that I didn't know. And this but that's is the literal sense. Of it. Yeah. And this play is a two-hander. You two are the only ones in the play. Mm-hmm. Is that a particular challenge? I mean, yes and no. It's a it's a challenge in that you don't get a break really. You're, <laughs> you know, you're dependent on each other completely, which for me as an actor actually is more of an advantage uh, because it allows me, it forces me to sink into the world of the play and listen to the other actor on stage with me uh, in, in, a, in a way that uh, sometimes you can, take, you can take a break up from when you're doing, you know, play with a larger cast. But we're so, like, interdependent on each other in terms of just not language, but in behavior and in and, and mood and action that, for me, it allows me to sink into the world of the play in a, in a way that I don't normally get to. What I, what I like about it, too, I'm not an actor in it, but as far as uh, it is very challenging because you really are on point the entire time. And it's such a it's such an intimate setting, too. That even if, you know, I talk about, you know, what you're doing without the ball when you're not talking and you're doing a lot of acting there, too. So you're always like Gavin said, you're always in it. You don't really have a chance to. To, to escape, you know, even when you go off stage for the brief moment that uh, that he does go off, he's still there, he's still in it, you know, so in that sense, I would imagine it's challenging. Yeah, I agree with both of you guys. Yeah. And Ron, this is your first time directing at APT. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? And- <laughs> yeah, you know, it's an interesting story because uh, I was telling the story the first day about how I, I knew David Frank from Buffalo. I'm, I'm from mm-hmm. Buffalo, New York, and he ran the Studio Arena Theater which is a theater that I came up in as a kid. I was uh, uh, re- recruited by Neil Dubrock, the founder of that theater. 
and David was the artistic director. And a good friend of ours, Stephen McKinley Henderson, recommended when I moved to Chicago, he recommended me, hey, call David. He's, he's now at this theater in Wisconsin somewhere. And I auditioned several times when I first got to Chicago. Hey, David, remember me from Buffalo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it didn't cast me. So, um, <laughs> so then I, it, things come around. It's, it's funny how things come around because uh, years later I was able to get my directing career going a little bit and here I am now. So things don't just happen, things happen just. That's a great saying. And um, I also wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, how Fugard came to write the uh, a, a play as a white man, to, to go back to that point. Um, he, he writes a lot about apartheid and um, he's, of course, quite pessimistic about the situation in South Africa at the time. Um, and things have changed there and changed here, but what, what does the play tell us about um, race relations today, especially in our society? Wow, that's a big question. That's I mean, that's a big question. I think, well, it's interesting to note that what inspired him to first write Blood Knot was his own relationship with his brother, not necessarily uh, apartheid. He came home one night and saw his brother after not having not seen him for a while, and his brother had always kind of been like the hero of the family, and he saw his brother asleep, and he saw him in a light in which he'd never seen him before. He was kind of broken down and beaten up, and he felt a certain kind of compassion and empathy for him that he said he hadn't felt before. And I think the genius is that he was then able to translate this into the world in which he was living, you know, apartheid in South Africa. But I think, you know, I think the larger picture is 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 has more to do with humanity and relationships between whoever calls themselves brothers. I, I, yes, we are Morris and Zach, and I look black and he looks white, but as Mr. Fugarda said, it's a larger story of just brotherhood. And so to that extent, I think whether it's 1961 or whether it's you know 2018, I think we as a, as a world, we as a country, we tend to only focus on physical, on the external, on the things that are right in front of us. And I think he's trying to get us to think a little deeper about when all is said and done, does race really dictate the kind of life that you live? Or can you, as a human being, make choices? Well, yeah, th I can't even add to that. That's, that's mm -hmm. exactly it in a nutshell, what, what Gavin just said. I, yeah, I, I second that. I third that. <laughs> but the play would have been different seeing it in 1961 in South Africa. For sure. Mm -hmm. well, uh, and seeing it in America in 1961, too, would be different, too. I mean, given the race relations at that time. And I just, without going into detail, I mean, I think it resonates profoundly today in the world of, of uh, not just black and white, of relations between any otherness to mm -hmm. someone. Mm -hmm. You know, how do, how do, how do, the, the, the the very literal lines of them were in this house together. How do we get along without, you know, being at each other's throats? And the blood knot, which is the bond between brothers, and I don't, I don't mean just literally genetic brothers, but all of us as brothers sitting in this room right here, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> you know, I think that is one of the larger messages. Of and, and even during their rehearsal, we're finding things that relate to us today. As we, as we work, we're like, oh, wow, that, that's so relevant to what we're doing, what we're going through today. That comes up all the time when we're rehearsing. And I'm sure that we'll leave the play knowing more about ourselves and about our world. Hopefully, thank, yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Talkbacks to Go is a production of Orange Tree Imports and Audio for the Arts. Our theme music is Er by Steve Tibbetts, and it appears here by permission of the artist, courtesy of ECM Records. Please find us on iTunes and YouTube under APT Talkbacks to Go. With Orrin Schroeder, I'm Buzz Kemper. Thank you for listening.